Okay, so here we are, three of three. Finally, we're to the end. So this is our last um, presentation talking about um, the opioid epidemic here in Bismarck and how we're all going to partner together and take on a little bit of a different approach to this. So uh, we're just gonna get started here. So again, I'm Missy Hankey. I'm the medical director of the Heartbeat Foundation. And this is the last 20 minutes you're gonna have to listen to me. So um, here's a little outline. We're gonna talk about mortality of OUD. North Dakota data, the US data, and then we're going to talk about the opioid overdose bridge. And now we're going to talk about the California bridge data because actually I realized that I um, ran out of time in the last one. So this time we will cover it. So this is just some data, uh, the impact of substance abuse on a drug user's life expectancy. And again, when we look at this, you can see that um, heroin is the bright blue line on top. So if someone uses five times a week, they're going to take about 25 years off their life. We use about one time a week, they're gonna take about seven and a half years off their life. So what happens if they use five times a day? We're talking about almost 51 years off their life. One time a day, so a daily heroin user is gonna take about 30 years off their life. So, um, and this doesn't talk about fentanyl, which is really driving the opioid epidemic, but there's no reason to assume that it would be less than that, right? I mean, we know that fentanyl is driving the opioid epidemic. And so likely that number is even more dramatic. So imagine, and we see people all the time that are using five times a day, you know, so average life expectancy is 80 something, well now it's 30, right? So this is why we're having this conversation because this greatly impacts life expectancy. So some North Dakota data, half of the 70 reported drug overdose deaths in 2018 involved opioids. And I will tell you that drug overdose deaths in North Dakota are reported poorly. Um, you all know this, you know who the county coroners are, you know that they may or may not even be a, a scientist. And you also know that they may or may not be influenced by their neighbors telling them, please, please, please don't put this down as a drug overdose, right? Or don't make this a suicide. Can't you just say that my 17 year old son had a heart attack? And lo and behold, he had a heart attack, right? So from 2013 to 2019, the age adjusted rate of death involving synthetic opiates increased over a thousand percent. Thousand percent. That's not good. Psychostimulants increased by 317%. So this is not just an opioid epidemic. And I, and I tell people all the time, we talk about the opioid epidemic, but really we're talking about an addiction. Um, we are seeing an increase in, in potency of all substances. We're seeing increased use of all substances. And again, everything's being laced with everything else. And so just because you think you're getting weed, you might be getting weed with some fentanyl. According to a 2018 um, community health needs assessment for Burley and Morton County, drug use and the presence of drugs and alcohol in the community were identified as top concerns. So again, since 2018, this has been a top concern, and now we're finally coming together to say, okay, what are we going to do about it? A recent study by SAMHSA, which is the, the Federal Substance Abuse Mental Health Services, revealed a 400% increase in admission to treatment centers for prescription drug dependence. And again, old language, but for an opioid use disorder, 400% increase. In 2018, let's bring it a little closer to home, Burley County health providers were the top prescribers of narcotic painkillers for injured workers in North Dakota. So half of all opioid prescriptions paid for by WSI came out of Burley County. And our prescription rate is almost twice that of Cass County per capita. So it's definitely in our, in our neighborhood. And again, we talked about how the, the opioid ep epidemic started with prescription pills and then switched to heroin because of supply and demand. And so we definitely have the supply here. And then again, even though that is decreased, we haven't decreased at the same rate as the other counties. Seizures of fentanyl and heroin made by the DEA in North Dakota increased 223% from 2019 to 2020. And I guarantee you from 2020 until now, it's increased again. I just don't have the numbers. First responders in our area have seen a drastic increase in the number of doses of Narcan administered. And then some US data. Again, we looked at this before, but from 2015 to 2019, overdose deaths rose 35%. And then from 2019 to 2020, it was another 39%, right? And again, opioids account for 70 to 80% of this. So we're talking about 70 to 80,000 people died of an opioid overdose in 2021. So this is why we're having this conversation. So um, looking again at our, at our country, according to the CDC, ED visits for opioid overdoses increased 30% from July 16 to September 2017. But look at um, Midwest. So rural America saw a 70% increase in overdoses during that same time. frame. So again, when we looked at all EDs across the country, it was 30%. Specifically in our neck of the woods, it was 70%. 
prior overdose is one of the biggest risk factors for having another overdose, which is completely counterintuitive, right? You think, okay, you know, if you overdose once, you would, you would be more careful, but that's not actually how it works, right? Because once you have that tolerance built up and you're engaging in those um, risk-taking behaviors, you're actually more likely to overdose again. In Delaware, half the individuals in the state who died of an overdose in 2018 had experienced a prior non-fatal overdose, and 52% of the overdose deaths occurred within three months of a visit to the emergency department. So it's not like you guys aren't seeing these people. You may not be seeing them for that, but you're seeing them for something, and then they're ending up dead. So Baltimore and Massachusetts demonstrated a 50% reduction of death rate when engaged with a medical provider and placed on mass. So that's where we're having this conversation, right? Because if we can reduce death by 50% simply by starting someone on medication-assisted treatment and connecting them with a medical provider, then, then that's pretty good medicine, right? We do lots of things in medicine that don't improve death rate by 50%, right? I mean, we give lots of chemo and, and lots of meds that are not reducing by 50%. Um, so the opioid overdose bridge was proposed by the Bismarck Police Department to build a bridge to intervene with overdose victims to transition them to MAT and substance use disorder treatment. So it's a partnership between law enforcement, Custer Health, your local EDs, Ministry on the Margins, and the Heartbeat Foundation. So we're not asking you to do anything by yourself, and I'm not trying to do anything by myself either. I'm trying to work with all of these agencies to provide the wraparound services that we need. So the goals of the project, increase access, capacity and utilization of medication-assisted treatment for individuals with an opioid use disorder. Increase access to MAT, so those people who have overdosed and are treated by the ED. And I highlighted this one because this really, I think, is, is the highlight of the project for me. Utilize peer supports and other evidence-based recovery support services to develop a bridge between the emergency department and substance use disorder treatment. We also want to increase the availability of Narcan. We want to increase communication efforts to reduce stigma surrounding substance use disorders um, MAT and OUD, sorry about that typo. So again, we talked about stigma the last time, that's a, that's a big part of this grant. And then we also wanna evaluate the success and make sure that everyone as we go along is understanding how things are working. And we all meet about it, right? Like you're all sitting in the room going, okay, she's saying a lot of nice words, but like, what am I gonna do about it? Well, here's how I see it. Patient presents to the ED after having been given Narcan by EMS or a loved one or, um, who knows, but they got Narcan. They're assessed by the ED physician who provides education regarding the opioid overdose bridge and the patient is interested. Okay, yeah, that sounds good to me. Phone call is placed to the peer support person on call 24 hours a day. Um, the ED physician is gonna provide the patient with the first dose of buprenorphine in the ED if the patient is deemed appropriate by the physician, right? The peer support person is gonna arrive at the ED to facilitate transfer to Heartview for further assessment and begin treatment. Now again, Monday through Friday during business hours, um, the patient will be assessed by a licensed addiction counselor in the, the rest of the time, there's gonna be peer support there and, and they're gonna facilitate them coming to Harview to see an LA. The patient will be provided education on Narcan by the peer support person. They're gonna watch a video with them and they're actually gonna leave the ED with Narcan, right? They're gonna have a little care package. It's gonna have Narcan in it. So at least um, if there's no follow through, at least we know they had Narcan. And then at discharge, the patient is given a one to three day script for buprenorphine. And if they've decided to enroll, that's what's gonna happen. And then, then the handoff happens, right? What about a drug screen? It's not diagnostically necessary, right? It just adds to the wait time and the cost. It's not gonna change what we're doing. If it comes up pan positive for all of the things, you know what we're gonna do? Well, we, we sort of expect that. It comes back positive um, for no opiates and you didn't test for fentanyl because maybe you don't have that capability we're not gonna be surprised, right? You guys know what opiate withdrawal looks like, you know what an opiate overdose looks like. So um, there's really, we don't need a drug screen. So who should be considered? Well, a patient who's experienced opioid withdrawal, right? They're, they're in and they're obviously in withdrawal, that's someone that should be considered for this grant. A pregnant woman with an opioid use disorder, right? Because we know that medication assisted treatment helps her and also helps her baby have a better outcome. Um, a patient who has received Narcan, again, to reverse an overdose. Um, and potentially someone who is not yet in enough withdrawal to start buprenorphine should also be considered. Like maybe they're there for an abscess, maybe they're there because they were in a car accident, maybe they're there for some other reason, but they tell you, hey, you know, here's the deal. Like I, I actually, I'm an IV heroin user or I'm, I've been shooting fentanyl and I, I'm super scared. I've had three overdoses in the last couple of months. I, I, need, I need treatment, right? You guys see people that come in all the time saying, I don't know what to do. I'm new to the area. 
I was on methadone, now I'm not, now I'm sick, um, or I'm not sick yet, but I'm gonna be. These are the people that you would consider utilizing this grant for. So what happens when the physician says, I don't think this guy's appropriate. They're just driving through from Washington to New York and they were on methadone and now they're not, I, they have no intention of staying. Then, then they're not appropriate, right? Uh, the patient requires admission. Well, in that case, you're still gonna call the peer support person. They're still gonna show up and, and talk to them about what this looks like and they're gonna stay in contact with them while they're in the hospital and facilitate them coming to treatment at discharge. What if the patient says, I mean, I've been on Suboxone before, I don't want any part of that. Okay, then they're not appropriate. What if they say, well, yeah, of course I want Suboxone, but I'm not going to treatment. Well, then they're not appropriate, right? <laughs> this grant is to facilitate a transfer from the ED to treatment. It's not, um, there are providers in the community that will just prescribe Suboxone without requiring treatment. So in that circumstance, I would just encourage them to, to go on the SAMHSA website and find out who the providers are in town and see if they require treatment. What if everything happens appropriately in the ER and the next morning, our peer support person shows up at Motel 6 to pick them up and bring them to Harview and they're not there? Well, in that situation, um, the ministry on the margin um, is gonna provide an outreach worker to stay in contact with that patient see if they can track them down and see if we can facilitate them coming into treatment or services without having to go back to the emergency department. So that's kind of where ministry on the margins um, comes in. Uh, what if, again, everything happens appropriately and then they show up to Harview and then say, you know what, this isn't actually gonna work for me. I don't know why I'm here. This, isn't, this isn't what I thought it was gonna be. And they show up in the ER the next week and say, yeah, you know that, that Suboxone you gave me last week, that was great. Can we do that again? Um, no, right? Because I mean, we've, we've talked about that this is meant to be a bridge to treatment. This is not asking you guys to, to get someone through every weekend so that they're not sick. So again, um, I know we've talked to some of the docs and they're thinking, you know, once every six months would be appropriate. Um, again, I, I would leave that up to your judgment. Um, I'm not gonna tell you what to do with your medical license, but certainly when we have patients that are with us on Suboxone and they, they bomb out of treatment or they you know, call us to see you next Tuesday or whatever, um, we do make them wait six months before they come back. So um, it's not unreasonable to say, look, that we did, not part, we did not sign up for this grant so that we can give you Suboxone every month. It's gonna be six months. If you're sick, you should probably call Harvey on Monday or call one of the other providers in the community because this is not gonna be your Suboxone provider. And the good news is that this, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. We're not the first ones trying to do this. We're the first ones that have done this, right? So again, this is the California Bridge model. Um, CABridge.org uh, implemented 52 hospitals across California, big and small, public, private, urban, rural, kind of all comers, right? Three pillars, treatment. So a low barrier access to evidence-based math. Connection. So establishing pathways to patients to outpatient care. And again, creating this culture of non-judgment, non-coercion, uh, building human connection. This is really that piece where the peer support people can be super helpful. Um, data since 2018, well, they saw 77,930 patients were substance use disorder, 52,000 had um, an opioid use disorder and 23,000 were provided abuse. So again, why I like this graphic is basically it shows not everyone you see has an opioid use disorder and not everyone with an opioid use disorder is gonna be appropriate for that. So, um, that's what they've been doing out in California. So what about treatment retention? Well, um, lots of studies have been done. This was a systematic review in the Journal of, of Addiction Disease, 2016, and there's huge variability in retention rates, right? Like some are up to 94% at three months, 91% at 12 months, um, but some as low as 3%. So um, it's never zero, right? So if you see 100 people, a good percentage of them are still going to be engaged in treatment at three months, four months, six months, and 12 months. Um, which again, keeps them out of your ED, keeps them in my office, keeps them engaged in treatment, not dead. So in patients using methadone maintenance treatment, they're on average 25 fewer deaths per thousand person years than in patients who discontinue it. So again, a reduction in overall mortality. Um, we don't necessarily have that same data for buprenorphine, but there's no reason to think that it wouldn't do the same, right? But again, we have better data for methadone because it's been around longer. I'm um, in a national cohort looking at people between 2015 and 2017. MOUD treatment with buprenorphine or methadone was associated with a 76% reduction in overdose at three months and a 59% reduction in overdose at 12 months. Again, pretty significant data when you're looking at the number of overdoses we're talking about. 
And then from 21 studies, the pooled all-cause crude mortality rates um, for people receiving MAT were 0.92 per 100 person years. In people that have been on MAT but then stopped, it was 1.69 per 100 person years. And for untreated, it was almost five per 100 person years. So that means that, you know, out of 100 opioid users in a year, five of them will be dead, right? So in five years, 25% of them are gone. So pretty significant data. And anytime you can keep someone engaged for more than a year, the data is better than if they're less than a year. Again, not rocket science, right? People that engage in treatment for their diabetes and actually um, stick with it do better than those that are kind of off and on intermittently. So again, to the questions, which substance abuse has the greatest negative impact on life expectancy? Cocaine, heroin, meth, or marijuana? First responders, administration of Narcan in the past several years has increased, decreased, or remained about the same. A prior non-fatal overdose in an opioid user will increase the risk for another overdose, decrease that risk, or basically it doesn't change the risk. And then which statement is true? MOUD decreases mortality in patients with OUD. MOUD actually increases mortality in patients with OUD. Methadone increases mortality more than buprenorphine. And every patient with OUD seen in the ED should be started on buprenorphine. So those are the questions that ends our presentation. Um, so any questions that you guys might have, uh, you will have my contact information, my email, my cell phone, um, all of the things. Um, my nurse is also going to produce a, a video providing some education to nursing staff. We just want to make sure that everyone is comfortable, confident. Again, we're, we're all on the same starting page, right? We've, we've not done this before either. So we're trying to piece it together and be as successful as we can be. We know there's going to be bumps in the road. So please bring them to our attention. Don't just stew on it and, and give up on the program. These programs work. They're, they're taking place all over the country. Um, they make a difference. And again, um, we all have to work together. So this, this is a really cool thing because we're, we're really going to partner with a lot of agencies and we're going to get some peer support people out there who have some lived experience. And that's going to have a tremendous impact. So reach out with any questions. And otherwise, um, good luck. This is going to be fun. And um, thanks for your attention.